Hey guys, it's Lee here from Andertons and it is my great pleasure today to have Misha Mansour um, in for a Captain Meets interview. So uh, anyway, thanks ever so much for coming in. Tell me about because I can never get the dynamics of the you know people show me gent stuff. I'm I, one of the guys I know well. I don't know if you've seen him on YouTube. Is a guy called Rabir Massad who's a, who's he's plays in a couple of bands, but has a band called Tosca that that is very much an instrumental kind of modern sort of proggy uh, you know heavy metal genty kind of band. Mm -hmm. And even if he shows me a lick, because I'm a naturally a blues player, I just don't pick it right, and so I never get the sound. Yeah, so I pick very strangely. So show us, show us how you. Like, so I, I, it's literally. Uh, I, I just. Do you mind if up. I just? I'm just going to do that yeah. when we're talking. No, no, no yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, so I literally just pick picked up a pick like this because no one showed me how to pick up a pick. Uh, I never took lessons. So I just kind of hold it with three fingers. It's almost like a Spanish Fink style kind of. Well, you know, it's it's really inefficient, but it but it has one advantage where you sort of strike the string a little bit differently. Let's give you some. Yeah, you strike the string like down at this angle. Yeah. Like a, I've been sort of learning proper technique, which has it sort of angled like that. If anything, and I think I I even angle it a bit too much when I'm trying proper technique, but I kind of like the sound. Um, but what happens is it's kind of digging almost from underneath and right up. As opposed to like a... Should be more traditional. But you can like... Here, you can hear the straight difference, away. right? Yeah. And this is actually, so for a while I was pretty um, obsessed with just switching over to this technique. But now I think I'm just going to try and be uh, convertible between the two. Um, What's the downside of your your picking technique? Then is it is it all picking is very is difficult? Yeah, like I, I'd say, sort of precision becomes very difficult. I always found I had a lot of trouble with all picking stuff, or any, you know. Actually, it uh, now that I've been kind of experimenting with what riffs work better, like a lot of uh, of Mark and Jake's riffs, uh, the other guitarists in the band who play with normal technique, I see how their riffs make a bit more sense. I find it's easier to sort of like aim at strings with this technique and and it actually requires a lot less motion yeah i get why this is proper technique now yeah. but like um but it doesn't sound it's it's un, it, it doesn't it sound, sounds different it sounds different I, I love the other problem i have as well as i think typically if i if i'm gonna just sort of you know right let's play i will take a guitar that's a you know 25 inch scale tuned with te you know strung with tens i'll drop it down and then, as I if I if I hit the string aggressively, I have a tuning problem, so that the thing doesn't. Yeah. But you're but you're almost using that slight detune and and the and the rise it's back like to part pitch of the sound. part of the sound, yeah, it isn't is it? Bit, so how yeah. do you get that kind of? Um, it, it, and it's interesting because like I kind of have to tune uh, appropriately. Like yeah, I, I'll, like if I tune this dead on the note, it'll go sharp. So I always have to kind of. Like, whoops! We didn't even check this against the tune. You see, I'll always when I'm checking my tuning, I'll always like kind of listen for it and and play aggressively, right. not not even this like, sort of timid thing, because then I'll just end up with a really sharp note. It's kind of one of those things, and and I've also noticed that my terrible technique does tend to accentuate that yeah. that uh, that sort of going sharp and then yeah. settling effect, yeah. as opposed to to this. So that's actually something that I've been using a bit more strategically these yeah. days, because there are parts where it's like, it's kind of. Yeah. And is that where having the, the extended range kind of helps control that? Oh, yeah, that? absolutely. I mean, this is 25 and a half, but um, on the uh, 7 is 20, 26 and a half. And that's one of the, uh, that's one of the huge advantages of, uh, of doing that is that I found that uh, I would get a lot less of, uh, of that settling effect, if yeah. you want to call it that. On the low string, we're tuned to drop A flats. That's pretty low. Wow. And that's, a, that's a 64 on there, which... 
I, I guess you could go heavier than that. Could yeah, you? you could go heavier. It's 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 relatively light. Um, but I like I not necessarily the the biggest fan of. I, I want to get away with the lightest gauges mm-hmm. that I can get away with. Or you know what? That's not true. There's a there's a sort of balance struck, and I've I've experimented with a lot of things. But when you go too heavy with them, you, you get this kind of like sort of woofy sound to yeah. it. This sort of it, it's a it's a bit much, and you don't get the attack out of it. And that's obviously something that's very important to me. You can hear that. And yeah. Sort of, you know, so yeah, like that's that's kind of what I want out of it. Um, and. I had to go with a longer scale because that would just end up being like the it sound like the first fret if I do something like that on a twenty five and a half tune that low, um, and then uh, the the like the eight strings that uh, that I use tend to be twenty seven inches, you right. know, to accommodate the the F sharp. Yeah. So it, it, these are things that you do have to be a little bit uh, aware of, you know. Yeah. But and, uh, and are you when you're going from the the you know it, if you take a sort of a, a a periphery kind of track and and you know invariably it'll have uh within the track kind of so much light and shade you know i mean it'll it'll go from brutal to sort of almost sort of angelic kind of tones are you very much the kind of person that will switch to a to a new guitar tone or are you trying to keep the tone the same and do everything from the volume on the guitar or? um i mean you know we use the axe effects so mm-hmm. much so yeah like i mean i won't I'll generally stick to the same sort of amps. Mm-hmm. Like I'll find a clean amp, and I use it almost in the way that you would like a channel. So yeah. you're just switching to the clean channel. So I've got my sort of clean patch, yeah. and I might use variations of that that are like tempo synced to yeah. the song or that have specific effects, which is one of the sort of advantages of the Axe effects. Yeah. But the philosophy is more like a clean channel. I'm kind of working um, with what I've got. Um, I, I was surprised again just going back and listening to different because that would be my approach of just like I want a clean sound so therefore let's get a clean amp sound yeah. and don't worry too much about uh, the volume on the guitar Yeah. and then kind of more recently I was experimenting or I'd been listening to some guitar players who would actually leave their guitar amp on the super super driven kind of tone and then take the volume of the guitar back so that there's just the tiniest amount coming out and you get this really different clean yeah, you know, it's still we did this clean. like push clean. I mean, yeah. uh, back when I had a, a Les Paul way back in the day, that was like the kind of trick you could do with yeah. the two volume. You know, use like the neck pickup for the yeah. cleans or something like that. Um, the difficulty with that for me is that uh, I tend to have like a noise gate right. uh, on the on the rhythm yeah. channel and and, and, a, and a compressor on yeah. the clean. So the volume knob doesn't have that sort of linear yeah. roll off, and, yeah. and uh, you know you have these things sort of fighting what you're trying to do. So yeah. I, I'm kind of locked into to just switching uh, patches. Uh, but like, for example, uh, that's why on the guitar, I really wanted to have these split coil settings. Yeah. Like, um, well, not, not entirely split coils. Like, uh, uh, this second setting is split inner coils, which I think sounds really... Yeah. And, then, and then position four is the outer coils, which yeah. is like chimey. It's like so, like kind of stratish, telly-ish well, that, sounds I out mean, of P- PRS were the first kind of guys to really do that back on the old custom twenty uh, fours, and uh, and I just remember that this idea of the inner coils versus the outer coils, and going, wow, you know, like tiny movements of yeah. of, of, of the spacing is is making pretty radical differences to the tone. Yeah, I think I find that in general with the guitar, everything is about these like very minute tolerances, yeah. like the you know millimeters of difference seem yeah. to make all the difference in the world with every yeah. everything. It's such a tactile instrument, I guess you know, like. I, and, the position, even where you place the pickups, because yeah. there's that whole like, oh, the 22 fret strats sound better because the neck pickups like yeah. under this harmonic node. You know, there's there's a, there's all sorts of things like that. So yeah, absolutely. Like this is a pretty massive difference if you compare I, I, these. I really enjoyed. I mean, I was lucky enough to be at the, the clinic that we did with Misha last night, and. Um, I must say as well, thank you very much because I know you got oh, a gig yeah. tonight, so it's kind That's of like good, squeezing man. it all in. It's all really really appreciate it, but. I, I was um, I loved your angle on because people want to know about your gear. You know, they want to know about your black machine and they want to know about Axe Effects and they yeah. want to know about the Jackson and you know. Uh, and I guess there's an element of of uh, tell me the secret of how to be like you, Misha. You know, okay. it's like and 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 I loved your angle about of there isn't. You know, it's like everybody's got to have their own personal 
journey to find. So if you can sort of recap on that, when the guy asked you last night about, you know, finding a guitar and you had some great advice, but maybe you could go over that again. Yeah, I mean, a guitar is really just a guitar, you know? It's it's kind of a, a boring, cliche answer, but I, I think... Uh, the world of guitar is so overwhelming and there's so many options and at times I feel overwhelmed like I walk into your store I'm like oh my god look at look at all the stuff right and sometimes you just want to go like all right so what's the best right yeah. because it's just overwhelming and you're like there's got to be a best and then it's kind of not the answer that you want to hear like it isn't the best you need to find what works for you which is perhaps a more disappointing answer up front, but it's kind of an exciting answer in the long run because, you know, and that's how you end up on your tone quest, which you're on for your whole life. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, so I guess that's what it is a little bit. It's like, instead of like, okay, this is what you should go for. It's like, no, now begins your tone quest, which will yeah. probably never end, you know? So it's a bit of a different answer. And and um, the, other, the other aspect of it is, you know, as you said, I... It, you use the word journey. I like that because that really is what it is. It, it's ever evolving. Um, the things that I liked uh, five years ago aren't exactly the things I like now. I, I'd say certain things are the same and certain things have evolved or my ears have become attuned to certain yeah. aspects that I like better. And and I mean, other things like uh, I'm really into to tellies and strats as well, you yeah. know, which, you know, obviously this is a super strat. So this yeah. covers my super strat needs, but like, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting old, but I love tellies and strats as well. So, it, you know, kind of uh, getting in tune with that kind of stuff. It's 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 always evolving, and, yeah. and I don't think it will ever stop, which is why that tone quest will never truly yeah. end, right? I, and I, th I think on my tone quest, one of, one of the things that I've um, realized is, is sometimes I've had a guitar or an amp or a pedal or whatever, and there's been a certain feature of that that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've thought to myself, well, therefore, I don't like that feature full stop yeah and then you realize that you might try another product that maybe has that feature but you know I, i'm just trying to think of a good example like pe I, people I have on, a good example well, go on then. like a 26 and a half inch scale uh i'm you know like i've, I've just never uh, personally got along uh with with schecter as a brand yeah. like just that they were never to my taste like the necks were kind of not my thing and but they were some of the first 20 sac, 26 and a half inch scale yeah. guitars I played for the seven string and I kind of wrote it off because I was like oh yeah. it must be the scale that I dislike yeah. about it but then I ended up trying some other guitars I forget what exactly that had the longer scale and I was like oh wait I actually do like this so it's yeah. kind of like taking in yeah. many many things yeah. at once and narrowing it down to this one yeah. thing and it is just it's about going look just put all your preconceptions to one side yeah. and try the guitar and if, if all the ingredients work in that guitar, then that's the well, one, isn't it? Well, here's the interesting thing. I should, you know, I should totally hate my Strat. <laughs> because philosophically and spec-wise and everything, it's it's just wrong. It's everything. Yeah. Like, okay, this is a 20-inch radius, big stainless steel frets, you know? Yeah. And it's a big flat ebony fretboard, you know? And... And like that thing is like, like what is it like a seven or a nine inch radius? I don't know what it is. It's round. It's yeah. very very it's a round. Vintage style. Yeah. Oh, so it's seven, a fifty nine. It's a fifty nine. So, yeah. So it's yeah. about seven point two five. It's round. Yeah. It's got tiny frets. You yeah. feel the fretboard whenever you play it. The action's all high, and because it's so round, it's different on every string. Yeah. You know, and like. I should hate that guitar, and yet I can't put it down. I, like, there's just something about it. Yeah. And the other thing, it, you know, it's really easy to to kind of just become specs obsessed or i see i see this on forums a lot yeah. like people just looking at pictures and just yeah. judging a guitar off the pictures and it, and ultimately for me it's really just about that feeling that a guitar gives you either you pick up a guitar and it puts a smile on your face or it doesn't yeah. and it's as simple as that and the specs are to help you understand maybe why you like the guitar or maybe to to provide some introspection after the fact, but it should never be the kind of thing where it's like, oh, you know, this has this spec, so therefore I'll hate it. Because you're closing yourself off. And as I said, I would have never even tried a, a, a Strat, mm -hmm. but, you know, it turns out I love them, Yeah. even though I would have thought I hate them. So that, that's that's the advice that, I, you know, this I like it, spec obsessed, I'm going to steal that from yeah. you. Know, because that, that's, I think, it's the worst thing that you can do, yeah, is absolutely. just write a product off because it has a spec that you think you don't like. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, all right, well, look, we've kind of come through this interview slightly a bit back to front. I, want, I wanted to talk a little bit more about just 
when you were growing up and kind of influences about that that would that, that made you want to um, grab a guitar and and I guess because you're in that sort of minority of you know you are genuinely considered as you know a pioneer of you, of the genre of music that, that you do which is weird i don't like that yeah well i i <laughs> it's it's kind of because because I, I you know because of that i suppose people will go so what you know what kind of what you know kick that off in you you know yeah. it's not like you it's 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 not like you just copied someone else you just did this Thing. Well, um, yeah, I guess starting from the beginning, uh, my mom forced me to take piano lessons when I was like four or five. I think I showed some uh, uh, musical uh, inclinations, I guess, when I was that age, because I think we were over at a friend's house, they had a piano, and I'd figured out how to play uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star by Eris on that. I don't remember any of this. We'll wait for the periphery cover of that. Right. Yeah. Out <laughs> some people will tell you it's already on our last <laughs> album. Uh, it's an inside joke for some of you. Anyways, um, yeah, so so uh, they forced me to take piano lessons, which I resented and hated. I actually did learn how to read music, and I, I learned like basic music theory. Uh, but because I hated it all, I retained absolutely nothing, which right. is why I don't know it. Uh, like I even did like solfege and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, anything that was related to the ear I found really easy and anything that was related to actually reading music was very hard for me. Yeah. And I remember my piano teachers getting very mad at me because I used to cheat and listen. They used to like sort of play through the piece that they were going to try and, and, and teach me and, and I would use that yeah. to sort of learn rather than like reading and they would always catch me doing that and they're like, no, you can't do that. Um, so I found all that very frustrating and um, I, and I, I think, you know, my mom had always wanted to learn an instrument but never had the means so she was sort of vicariously living through me, um, which, is, which is fine, you know, like I get it but like it did make me not appreciate the instrument and like I had to practice for a certain amount of time if I wanted to watch a certain amount of TV, you know. So there's just this kind of resentful relationship with the, with the piano and all I really wanted to do was play drums and guitar, I remember, but like, you know, they weren't having that, like yeah. drums, like they were like, you'll go deaf, we'll go deaf. And the guitar, I guess, for whatever reason was just, you know, it was never a thing that, you know, the piano was something that we had around. Um, so I'm actually Jewish, and I right. had a bar mitzvah, right. and you get money for your bar mitzvah, so uh, I used that money to buy myself my first, um, my first drum set and my first guitar, and I actually wanted to be a drummer first, yeah. and that's what I focused on for the first few years. Well, why say. are so many drummers that turn to guitar so good? Do you, I mean, do you, think, do you think drums teaches you sort of fundamentally something that perhaps if you're a guitar player that never goes down the drum route? I think I always think drummers and bass players that play guitar yeah. always seem to have something that just regular well, guitar players. Well, you know, don't have. I mean, it, well, I think I think that's a fair point. Um, perhaps it's a sense of like the, I mean, those things are the backbone of the song, and and maybe, um, like for example, when I'm thinking of a riff, I always. Yeah. always have a drum beat in mind. And that's something that I realized that not everyone does. Yeah. But I took it for granted because I always, yeah. I, 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 I thought, yeah, everybody, everybody has. Yeah. And I remember talking to people, I'd be like, so what kind of beat are you hearing of this? Like, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> like, you know, like I have, I have three different ideas of how this could go. So, so it's kind of thinking of, of guitar and drums uh, and bass as being this sort of this one sort of entity yeah. and like it's just part of that as opposed to like guitar just being an instrument by itself and kind of you know everything else will sort of come together separately right yeah. um so maybe that's why i don't know I, I don't know for sure but um i do know that i mean i've had this question before at clinics and and, and meet and greets and you know people ask like how important it is to play drums or whatever. And I say, you don't necessarily need to play drums, but if you understand them, it goes a really, really long way. Just understanding the mechanics of what you can do with four limbs, yeah. understanding um, how drummers tend to play. And really all it is is just listening. Um, Nolly, the bassist in our band, like he doesn't really play drums but he understands and he can really hear yeah. drummers and he can program drums really well as a result because he knows what yeah. their tendencies are. He really understands it. And I think that that can help you approach uh, sort of riff writing and songwriting from a more complete perspective yeah. than just like, oh, I have some guitar riffs, you yeah. know? 
Do you want, is there any kind of example you could maybe give of, uh, of how you might approach, just with any sort of simple riff, how you might sort of rhythmically try and make yeah. it different to... I mean, actually, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So it's like uh, one, of the, one of the songs that I did, this is uh, The Bad Thing. And there's this riff, I mean, it's like a really odd time sounding riff. It's actually just 4-4, four, four, but it's like... Uh, it's like kind of hard without a click to, to hear yeah. what's going. Like, uh, if you give me like a click. Okay. What? And that's where it repeats, right? Now I know that sounds like kind of weird, uh, but the way you accent it will completely change the context of it because it's like um, we have. So when I was demoing, I was like. Uh, playing around with the snare placement because that makes it sound like almost more odd and and I, I like our riffs to have a sort of pulse to them, you know? Yeah, yeah. So like what you were hitting there would be what would uh, like the I crash should I have China. I should have accented every sort of four, shouldn't I? Or well, you were you were kind of accenting where I would where I would accent the cymbals, for right. example. So like that's what the cymbals are like dun, 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 You know, and the snare is kind of offbeat there, but it comes back as like a, a backbeat kind of thing. Yeah. Dun, 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 so you're dun. you're trying to sort of right hand uh, interpret what the bass drum would be doing on on the kick. Yeah, a lot of the, times they're they're a lot of times they're locking in. Um, the kick isn't doing. Uh, every hit that I'm doing, I'm doing actually. It's pretty interesting because I'm doing like some ghost notes, like right. what I'd call like. Well, you can't really. You know, like those kind of yeah. like lead-in notes, yeah. uh, because you know, and and this the the drums are doing ghost notes too. So it's like kind of this this rhythmic uh, and dynamic interaction between the instruments. But but the context, uh, I actually uh, put up a uh, drum programming tutorial on YouTube okay. to show my approach. And and one of the things I did was show kind of one of these riffs that's like got this sort of, sort of rhythmically ambiguous yeah. uh, feel to it and, and showing how, how different beats over that can drastically change the context and how those can sort of feed into the flow of a song. Uh, how... Be because uh, you know, there's certain things that might be sort of better as a release, or sort of, sort of things that might be building tension. Like I think, for example, if the snare is kind of offbeat, that like kind of builds the tension, yeah. and then and then if you have like a backbeat, that's kind of like a satisfying who, release. Who was there. your favorite drummer then, as a as um, when you were learning to play? What's your favorite guitar? You know, it's like <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's uh well, I, I'd say when I was growing up, I was, I was up, like John, you know, like John Bonham or something. Would be oh. he'd be my. You know, so so John Bonham, someone I have a, a lot of respect for. I, I got into him a lot later. You know, you know, it, it was something that uh, I appreciated later. I think when I was younger, I was more into like the the show offy yeah. drummers, just because it was like, oh wow, you could do this. Yeah. Um, you know, so Mike Portnoy from Dream right. Theater was a was a very yeah. big influence. I used to uh, play along with a lot of the Dream Theater stuff and try to learn that. Um, uh, but like I remember like playing trying to learn like Dillinger Escape Plan you know like Chris Payne from Dillinger yeah. Escape Plan was doing like some crazy stuff I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard them I don't know you know if it's for everyone but but um, what is going on drumming wise is pretty insane <laughs> so it's like just hearing that it's like wow that's possible I can't believe a drummer's playing this you yeah. know yeah So if we take it back to we we were uh, we were kind of talking about sort of life as a sort of an early musician and your influence uh, as as of someone that had played drums and guitar at the same time. Um, when do you think you know what? When did you start realizing that what you were playing hadn't really been kind of done before? I I don't really look at music that way. I don't like I don't know if that's true. I don't kind of care. If that makes sense. I think that's for other people to say. Yeah. You know, that's it. I'm never like, like I was never one of those people. I had some friends who were like, "Oh yeah, you shouldn't write music unless it's like original. You should be going out there trying to do something original." I'm like, "That's boring. I don't want to think about that. Why can't I just write the music I want to write? Like, yeah. I don't care if it's original or not. I just want to write stuff that makes me happy. You know, uh, that's that's always been the, the approach. I think it's for other people to say yeah. whether they think they're original. I'm sure to some people, my music is the most unoriginal. Thing they've ever heard and maybe to some people it is original 
But, you know, that's that's a, a, a battle that you, you could argue about, you know, to the end of time, and then you won't even write any music, you know? Yeah. Like, I don't worry about that stuff. I just kind of go for it. Was there a... Um I mean, I, I I listened to uh, sort of the the, the 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 periphery kind of back catalogue pretty religiously for about a week prior to this sort of interview, mm-hmm. and the early stuff is I, I certainly I felt as well that the, the, the early stuff was almost kind of um, there wasn't really any kind of uh, no. Let me just try and I don't want to make this come out sounding wrong. The, no, no, the, the, no. You, you, I want you to be honest. I'm actually really curious because if you, you've had this sort of crash yeah, course. It is exactly. In like yeah. the last like you know what what six seven eight years yeah. in some some cases of yeah. my life, uh, yeah. and it's actually really interesting. I, I don't want you to sugarcoat this. Well, Give it to me straight, it's doctor. Not, it's not a bad. It's it's. I f- I found the first two albums uh, difficult to. Um, sustain the listening experience right. you know I, I felt almost like I need to kind of lie down after five minutes yeah. because there's so much going on there is a lot um, and I think as a as someone that perhaps typically would listen to uh, you know like a a, a, a less um you know, forceful kind of uh, music. I, I would sort of go within a periphery and go, oh, I really, really like that bit. And then there'd be another bit that was like, well, I'm struggling here. Yeah. Um, but it seemed to me that it was almost just like, look, this is what this is what's coming out and I'm just going to do it. And if people don't like it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and then the, 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 the albums that came out this year, um, they certainly seem to have a more not conventional structure but you know I was literally sitting there going oh actually there's there's a lot more of this that I'm sort of finding that I can kind of get off on yeah and enjoy. well it's interesting that you say that because I mean this look like you're only doing the best that you can at any point in time and then when you're done with it you're like all right where what do what do I do right and what mm-hmm. I do wrong and uh, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday at the clinic it's a difficult thing to go and like sort of honestly critique your own music mm-hmm. because it's very personal, it's yeah. emotional. But I think after you, you have a little bit of distance, like after the album's out and it's like kind of like, that's it, yeah. you know, now I'm working on new stuff, it's very easy to look at it a lot more objectively. So now I can see those albums mm-hmm. for what they are. And I know that that with Periphery 1, first off, I wrote that basically, I, I wrote most of that album myself. Like it was basic, and I did most of everything on it. And it was basically my solo project kind of with with a band that was trying to get together yeah. and it and because I have absolutely no vocal talent whatsoever it was written as an instrumental album right. and the vocals were thrown on the top after the fact because I wanted to have vocalists right. but because I was not approaching it from the point of view of a vocalist I'd never left space so you have a lot of stuff going you're yeah. right it is like sort of this this just onslaught on your senses it's like what am I even supposed to be listening to yeah. and now I hear that so clearly and uh, on the second album, we started to be aware of that, but some of the stuff was already written kind of in that context. And some of, you know, and that's when, you know, uh, our, our vocalist had joined like right at the end of the first album. He had to like write vocals and sing parts that I had written or other people had written or whatever. It wasn't his album at yeah. all. Uh, the second album was where he wrote uh, all the vocals. And I, I helped out with that too, but you know, we were still trying to figure out this balance. And it wasn't until these last two albums that we're like, all right, we need to write with space for these damn damn vocals because it, it's kind of it's kind of a crappy thing. It's like, all right, dude, here's this song, make vocals yeah, happen, sing over it, you know, yeah. just yeah, do it. And and he's like, uh, okay, you know, and it's like arrangements wouldn't change. So what we've been doing now is like, not only am I thinking uh, more, I'd say I'm more aware of vocals and how they work and what yeah. makes sense and what our vocalists can do and will do how we you know I, I have all that in mind now when I'm writing but I'm also leaving space so now there could be an interaction there can be parts where the guitars are doing their thing or or, or if there's gonna be vocals or I'm like this could be a chorus then the guitars really shouldn't be going you know at light speed because it's like it's just gonna clash and it's kind of this awareness that's allowed for I think the the music to be a bit more palatable you know yeah. for like long listens and and, yeah. and and more digestible like there still is a lot going on but it's a bit more uh uh calculated in how in, in its approach rather than just sort of full on on the instruments full on on the vocals and the drums and you know like everything's just kind of got its place now yeah. I, have you ever again this i mean my i'm uh, 10 years older than you are 
and so I guess I was probably listening to, but I, I, in my teens, probably listening to very different music that you listen to. But some of the guitar playing, that, that the cleaner guitar playing that you do, as I was listening through it, I was thinking, do you, you, did you ever listen to a band called Marillion, a guy called Steve Rothery? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, that's interesting because again, look, they, I mean, they certainly were. They were a kind of a proggy rock band back in yeah. the. Um, 80s I guess but yeah it's interesting because a lot of those kind of clean chorusy kind yeah. of uh, nice clean parts always remind me of uh, some of the stuff that they did and then, and then they would almost kind of go into something uh, nothing like the sort of heaviness that you might go into but they would go into a more of a rocky kind of vibe but I wonder if like they were like a dream theater influence or something because I love dream theater and it's like maybe maybe maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe it's like an influence of my influence that you're hearing which yeah. is very 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 likely I suppose you know? ultimately doesn't isn't that uh, it, it must be like that what, what's the what's the, is it seven seven links to Kevin Bacon we can all kind of go right right, right, it, right. does everything ultimately go back to uh, Buddy Holly at some point yeah yeah, of, know, course, like... of course it does, you know, <laughs> but it's like, uh, it, it's interesting um, because you will see a lot of these things that they are sort of generational. It's like, um, you'll say this band reminds you of this, but it's like kind of the band that they influenced. That's the band that influenced, you know, this, this, this younger band. Uh, so it's never so clear cut, but then it, it does kind of follow this sort of timeline that makes sense, you know, so I'm sure that's the case. Where's the kind of periphery thing going? Because I know you've got solo stuff going, and you've got lots of other bands or a couple of other bands. Yeah. Are you still? Are you? Are you? Are you sort of trying to write with a sort of? Oh, let's let's see what I can do within this genre, or is it still very much just your own brain going? Look, there's all this stuff coming out, and it's just you know. It's more that, and and now we're more collaborative. I mean, that's the thing is, I did the the first album myself just because it wouldn't have gotten done otherwise yeah. but the the end goal was to find a band that i could work with that i could write with and we are all on the same wavelength about it which is that you know i don't know what the next album will sound like it'll sound like whatever we put together really right. and it shouldn't be anything else and there really is no argument at this point to not do that because that has worked out very well for yeah. us it, yeah. to just do whatever we want to the point where you know we don't really get complaints from anyone even our label like even the people that you might expect yeah. to complain about it are, are quite happy because they they get what they want out of it but like um yeah and and i mean like uh the the newer material seems to be going over the best so we're just going to kind of learn from our past mistakes mm -hmm. uh but write whatever sort of comes to us you know it yeah. won't be a concept album because we've done that and, yeah. and like that was you know a lot of work and it was it's like that's that maybe maybe in a couple albums but now i think we want to do something a little bit more straightforward and direct in its delivery if that makes sense yeah no, a I bit can, more varied in the in the sound see that. you know um but uh, that that's just where I'm at, you know. Maybe the other guys are somewhere else, and it'll be some sort of mixture of everything. But I think that's kind of cool. It's like you don't know what your next album is gonna be. It's gonna be whatever it's gonna be. I think that's yeah. I mean, absolutely. And and that's, I think again, good advice for anybody out there that was trying to write their own stuff was almost just to sort of look. You're just gonna have to, just you know, don't try and be contrived about what you're writing. Yeah, and I mean, there, there's always pressure. There's always a little bit of pressure, especially from fans. And you'll never please them, because if you if you make the same album five times in a row, they'll be like, you just made the same album. And if you make a different album, they'll be like, oh, we just wanted that last one. And and I'll, I'll say, like, it, it's really funny. Like, uh, we're, the, we're the best three out of five band, you know, three out of five star band out there. You know, like, <laughs> like it, it seems like we're the, we're the most mediocre band ever, because we put out an album, and it's just like, everyone will be like yeah it's okay it's either, it's either maximum marks or no 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 no, no, no. it's 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 neither really they're like yeah it's okay 
And then, like, like our first album came out, I remember, it was like, yeah, it's okay. And then we did our next album, and they're like, yeah, it's okay. Not like their masterpiece that their last album was. I was like, what are you talking about? Everybody was just like, this is whatever when it came out. And then we did the, the two albums this year, and they're like, yeah, it's okay. It's not like the masterpiece that the, the last album was or the one before that. You know, it's like... You know, I, I think I think we're a bit of a slow burn, and there's no point in trying to please anyone else because they're just they're always gonna complain. So we might as well just do the album that we want to do, and that that is my advice: is like, don't worry about what other people will say because they will complain no matter yeah. what you do. So so uh, I see some people try to sort of cater to that, and then you'll always end up disappointed. But if you if you just write the album that makes you happy, yeah. then at least you'll be happy. Yeah. They'll still be complaining, but at least you'll be happy. My, my favorite story on that is I had a, a friend that, that knew um, uh, Angus and Malcolm Young, and they, they you know, had this huge, huge kind of break uh, prior to the last album coming out. They hadn't written anything. And apparently, they would get to get. They've been getting together for years. Going, we just got to try and write something that isn't just another ACDC, you know, back in black, you know, just structure. Right. And nothing happened. Nothing. Happened. And eventually, they just went. Let's just write. Let's just forget about kind of do something different. Let's just write some songs that we like. And within a week, they just had the latest ACD. It's it's completely ACDC. It's like you know, any of the songs on that album could be off any album right. they've ever done. All the fans love it. But it works. It, it works. And they're happy. And, they, and they're happy. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. It's not about... I'm not saying that having every album be different is the right way or having every album be the same is the right way. The right way is whatever you yeah, choose. Yeah, to be honest. It's it? whatever you choose the yeah. right way to yeah. be. It's not what I say. It's not yeah. what anyone else says, yeah. you know? And I still think, actually, I mean, this is even having, you know, worked in a guitar store for 25 years, maybe more now. This, the, the thing I love about music and guitars... Uh, is there's no right or wrong. Yeah, right. There's never, there will never be the best band or uh, the best guitar. There'll be the best selling band and the best selling guitar. Right. But that's almost irrelevant. You know, but isn't like, it interesting how, so, so, you know, what you're saying is like, all of this is subjective. And yet the problem arises because people are so emotionally attached yeah. to everything that they try to turn it into something objective. There's yeah. very few things where people take the subjective and like try to turn it into something objective other than with art. You yeah. know, it's like, it's like yeah. entirely, yeah. like I don't, I don't entirely understand it, but I do relate a bit because I understand it's like this emotional, it's human irrational nature, Human attachment. nature. Yeah. I, I want you to agree with what I think. Right. You want me to agree with what you think. Exactly. But but, but but yeah, but like obviously the basis of all of this is that nobody's going to agree. Yeah. And therefore not everyone is going to like whatever you do, no matter how great or terrible. Like no, there will never be a consensus yeah. on anything. But that's what keeps it fresh. And I think if you can be open-minded as a musician and as a guitarist and sort of just go... Maybe I, you know, maybe the the, the 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 juggernaut, you know, maybe that is. If that's your favorite guitar, then that's fantastic, and if that's yeah. what inspires you, and if the next guy is a Les Paul, and the guys after that is a Strat, you know, it's all fantastic. Yeah. And just the, or if it's even if it's a violin, and you want to go and write, exactly. you know, you play old, you know, write a concerto, you know, it's like it's all cool. It's this all, brings it's us all right good. back to the beginning. I don't know how you're editing this together. Yeah, but no, the beginning. That's his this deal. brings us back to the, to this other point that may or may not have been spoken about yet, but <laughs> but like about like you know the, the the kid in the guitar store, like you know uh, what's the best, you know, and that's and that's really yeah. what it all comes down to. Yeah. It's like there there is no best, yeah. and you just. It's the you one just need the to commit to the fact that yeah. you have to find out. It's yeah. not an easy answer, and you have to it's spend the time to find out for yourself at, what at the that, answer is. At that stage, and arguably even at any stage, it's the one that puts the biggest smile on your face. Yep, that's, that's, the, that's, that's it. That's that, the best that is one. literally it. Um, and you can only find that by trying as many as you conceivably can. Yeah. <laughs> So let, let's talk about gear. Yeah. Let's talk about gear. So we um, we we'll talk about the guitar first, and then maybe we can just touch briefly on the backline because I know you're kind of uh, you know everyone will know you as an Axe FX guy, but I think there's probably yeah. a lot more to it than that. But um, perhaps it's just easiest to say on the backline that you know you've used all sorts, and you continue to just use whatever gives you the tone that you want to use. Uh, I mean, day. really, it's just the Axe Effects. Like, yeah. that's, that, at the end of the day, like, that's what we record with, that's what we use live, yeah. it's the most convenient thing, it's, we travel with it. Like, we have our rig yeah. in every country, it's dual voltage, it's great, it works, it's like the most reliable rig ever. I love amps to yeah. death, but 
there's it's just the most practical thing yeah. and, the, and like uh for the periphery sound it it is really the best sounding thing yeah. too i think some people wonder if it's a bit of a compromise but um if amps gave us the best yeah. sound for periphery i probably i think we'd all probably just go through the trouble of getting the amps the yeah. truth is yeah like the periphery sound is made on the axe effects it's evolved over the axe effects so being able to have like your exact studio tone yeah, yeah. be your live tone is kind of awesome yeah and, and that's I, what we use i quite like that that you are you again were saying last night that the the argument of does the axe effects or whatever you know the, there are other products available you know does that sound exactly like the amps it claims to sound like and you're kind of going well no not necessarily but that's kind of almost not the point anymore. yeah it's the, not the, 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 the axe effects is the sound what, what it does periphery. what it does effectively is get the character i yeah. think it gets the character like the overall eq curve might be a little bit different i think that's what people kind of worry about and a lot of that even just comes down to the cab yeah or or, or you know or but even if you were to run it through the same thing it would be a little bit yeah different but i don't i don't think that's objectively uh good or bad i think that's mm. up to you to decide yeah. it's not a, a big enough difference but they get the character right i have the real life counterparts of all of the amp models that yeah. i that i like to use uh on the axe effects and it totally nails what it is about that amp that i right. really like yeah so it it's like it's like yeah that you know for all intents and purposes it is that amp and it must save you a fortune touring with uh yeah oh my god <laughs> oh my god and, and like just being able to take our entire rigs in uh, in pelicans you know yeah. um we, we just pack everything up in in those little uh, racks and and put them in, in pelicans and we have them all over the world <laughs> So let's talk about this glorious looking guitar. Yes. Uh, and so how did you first meet uh, the Jackson guys? I believe it was at Sonosphere in 2011, 2011, yeah. They had a booth there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really ever paid too much attention to Jackson, to be honest. They never had like sort of the high end stuff in my guitar center. Yeah. And I hadn't encountered the, the USA stuff a lot. And um, I went into this booth and I started playing some of the stuff and I was like, wow, this is, this is really killer. And it's consistent. Like all these guitars are really killer. And that sort of started a, a conversation. Um, I really actually was like, I was playing this uh, Adrian Smith model. Yeah. That, uh, that was just awesome. It was like kind of bringing the best of like the super strat and the strat yeah. together, and uh, and I was just like, this is a this is a really cool guitar, and it's like a USA signature model. They seem to translate really well, you know, and and that kind of got some gears turning, and uh, when it came time to looking at a company to uh, to do a signature, actually Jackson's the only company I asked, right? And they said they they um, they said yeah, we'd be interested in doing that. And um, I think in my head, I thought it was going to take like, you know, eight months to a year, have it out by next night. And like two and a half years later, we're like ready to like put it out, you know? Yeah. So it, it's been a long project because uh, we carved out a new shape and, uh, you know, that takes a lot of work as opposed to just sort of taking an existing design and, yeah. and just sort of specking it out the way I'd like it. We had to sort of build a guitar from scratch and... A lot is involved with that. It's not just like, okay, well, now you have your shape. It's like, all right, now this needs to be programmed and people all need the to be best, trained. You know, like all the best signature guitars take that amount because it. Yeah. Uh, there, there's definitely there's two signature there's two types of signature yeah. guitars out there, aren't there? There's the artist that goes, yeah, I'll take five percent on that. Just put my name on the head. Yeah, or or, or um, not even that, but it's just like you know, I like this pre-existing design, um, and. I don't think there's anything wrong with. It. I mean, like Jake and Mark and, yeah. and our band, they they took pre-existing designs that they were huge fans of. Yeah, okay. And they're like, it's like, hey, no need to mess with it. Like, I really like this, but here are all the changes I'm gonna make, and yeah. they're pretty substantial changes yeah. at the end of the day. So that's their signature model. I mean, I guess there are the people who are also like, I don't care, you know, yeah. and like whatever. Yeah, uh, make it red and give me, you know, yeah. my <laughs> percentage. But that that was more the kind of thing I was. Uh, yeah. yeah, and and that again, and do you know what? Even as I said that, I thought that's a bit unfair because if your favorite favorite guitar is that, you don't want to change it, then why wouldn't you just? Change I mean, that, the color and that, that's the thing. Like for example, your... Mark's favorite guitar has always been the PRS yeah. body shape. Yeah. So you know, 
even if he had the opportunity, I don't know that he would have yeah. changed it because he's just like, no, that's a, that's a guitar. But and I've was, always liked Super Strats. It was, was a ground up kind of design. Yeah, I mean, like, it, you know, it's it, it's an amalgamation of a lot of things. Like, I love Super Strats. Yeah. Um, I love big shreddy carves. Um, I love uh, this sort of uh, flat bottomed. Uh, that is a big carve, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's massive. And, and the whole idea is like to get that like shredder carve without yeah. compromising the front. Um, I, I like the thinner bodies, um, and I wanted it to be uh, a arch top or a carved yeah. top, you know, yeah. like this, but but with a, a genuine top, like not not a yeah. veneer or anything like that, you know, like I wanted to be a big slab of maple. I, I like um, what you were saying as well about the, the, the attention to detail that's gone into this, because yeah. by, by making this top horn uh, as slim as it is for the, the carve, yeah. you've had to do some sort of internal reinforcement to, to yeah, sort of keep it. Yeah, that's, that's uh, Jackson engineers that I have to thank for that, because they figured that out. I kept breaking guitars here, yeah. Because we tend to thrash about a bit on stage and do stupid things, so so I find that this would kind of break. And we went through a few iterations before they found something that sort of uh, kept up. And as I said, like I'm I'm aware of the fact that the grand majority of people who get these guitars will probably not be abusing it the way that I do. But I was adamant that like every guitar had to be something that I could play live. Like it had to yeah. be my guitar, no compromises. So. These these feel extremely consistent with the guitars I play live. I could I could just take this. I wouldn't even really need to set this up. Like, it's it's not what you would call kind of wizard skinny, is it? No, no, absolutely not. It's it's but it's not thick. It's no. like kind of it's in between because because I need the neck stability. I had I had really thin guitar necks and I had really sort of fancy guitar necks on the road before, and like as great as they are and as cool as like they they may look. They are such a pain to deal yeah. with on the road, and so I learned that lesson the hard way. And and I also found that in the end, like a, a, a you know more mass in the neck tends to be uh, more favorable for for the sound that I'm going for. Um, I didn't want to go too big on that uh, just for for comfort reasons. So I found sort of a nice middle ground there. Yeah. But uh, what I like is that it's like this sort of rounded thing. I never really liked the big square yeah. square necks. Um, with my weird technique, it kind of made it harder for me because I tend to put my thumb around here. So if like if there's like a ledge for it, it it's just kind of weird. But yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think like all of these aspects are extremely deliberate. Yeah. These aren't sort of accidents, you know? Yeah. Um, you, you were quite um, specific about the, 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 the timber used as well, weren't you? And, and oh, yeah. again, without wanting to fuel the flames of that argument. Um, Tell us about why you, you specifically chose uh, the, the, the woods that were on this guitar. So the maple neck, mm -hmm. which is very plain, it's hard rock maple, but it's one of the most stable things. And you know, this needs to be a touring guitar. This, as I said, this needs to be a guitar mm -hmm. that I can use. So it, so, uh, it had to have a, a super stable neck and I just found nothing that was more stable than uh, quarter uh, mm -hmm. hard rock maple. Um, ebony is, my favorite for fretboard just because of the feel it's very smooth for bends and vibrato and things like that it's just like the tight grain pattern makes it very it makes for a very nice feel um and uh the the top as i said i, I knew i wanted to have um well we have two versions we have like a solid finish and we have the, the sort of premium top and then the premium top i knew that i wanted it to be a big slab i think it's like a five eighths inch right top so it's very substantial and uh the body needed to be thinner Originally, we were messing around with uh, basswood, which, again, it's not a very impressive looking wood. It's not expensive. It's not fancy. I just think it sounds great, but it, it was a bit too porous, and, and the top was so strong that it used to bend some of right. them, and uh, they were able to source alder that had very similar density, so it actually didn't change the tone, uh, and it had similar weight. Um, so we used the uh, alder and maple combo on the premium top ones. Um, but again, like basswood is one of those things that, like you know, that spec spec fanatics, you know, yeah. like they sometimes just go nuts. And it's like it's always been one of my favorites. It's been the favorites, or it is the favorite of a lot of my influences as well, which is probably why I like it so much. Yeah. Um, well, you get it on you can get it on a ninety nine dollar guitar, or you can get it on Guthrie's. Right, you get on Guthrie's or, Vise, or, or Satriani yeah. or Petrucci. Yeah. So, like it's 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 weird. And and again. 
You know, because um, I think sometimes people think like I got bashed because it was a compromise or something. It's like no, it's just like it's that's just like that's what I wanted, mm. and it's very easy to get a consistent source that's like a certain weight. The weight of the guitar is important, yeah. and I, I wanted these to be light guitars because they tend yeah. to sound the way I want, like a light bolt-on guitar with a stiff neck. Just always has a sound that that is that is pleasant to me. It's very consistent. So it's. You get we've gone with hip shot hardware, which I think everybody knows is is awesomely just good hardware. Super reliable, yeah. very comfortable. It's the best sounding bridge. I've tried a lot of bridges. Like this is super clever, isn't it? These I'm are not, I'm not yeah. seen this done before. Um, that was just something that like I asked I for because that. because again this is just very me. Like I don't like tone knobs live. I find that they get in the way, and I actually like have this like sort of nervous tick where I'm always like kind of making sure it's at full yeah. because I hate to think that's rolled off. I don't need to do it on this yeah. guitar. I still do it. But the idea is that it's actually bypassed and going straight to the volume. So you get a slight brightness boost because yeah. the, the tone pot will just take a little bit away. But if you activate it at full, you'll get the tone pot and you can kind of place it wherever you want. And it's sort of locked into position as well. Like, you know, if it's like, you know, all the way down or halfway down, just sort of lift it up and it'll drop into place. So. Um, oh, I see. So that's even... So it's I like get, you know, I, I get it. So it actually, so like, like, I mean, it's like a preset. Yeah. You get some that's uh, a, effects with it. That's, that's a cool idea. That is a but it was just really to be out of the way. It's a, it's yeah, just sort of have your cake and eat it. It's yeah. uh, I get my tone knob, but it's out of the way when I need it. And if I really want, I'll know it's on because the, the knob's up. You know, and. Uh, your relationship with uh, our wonderful friends at Bare Knuckle. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's these are a beastly sounding set of pickups. Yeah, it's the, 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 the aptly named uh, Bare Knuckle Juggernaut pickups, right? So uh, these these are pickups that I spent quite a bit of time working with Tim at Bare Knuckle with. They're, they're unique in design in that they're hybrid. Yeah. They're, uh, they're Alnico and ceramic, which yeah. is a pretty unique design. And it was because I wanted sort of the best of both worlds with yeah. that. I always liked the sort of tight and fast uh, response of a ceramic, but I didn't really like the ice picky top end. I didn't like how how they tend to be very compressed. And I like the sweetness and open nature of a Alnico pickup. So I, I you know, I, I gave him a wish list mm. of like sort of adjectives and things that I wanted, and uh, and that's. He's certainly the guy to talk to about pickups. Isn't oh he? my you, God! You, yes. You, uh, I mean, who'd have thought there were so many ways to take a magnet and some copper wire right. and make a different sounding, uh, you know, component? But, and while uh, we were there, we were experimenting with so many different aspects. It was blowing my mind. And he himself will tell you, it's not a science; it's an art because right. there's just so many variables. That, and there's no sort of definitive. There hasn't been definitive research done on this. So he, he was excited because he's like, it's my opportunity to yeah. sort of discover what we can do and. Everything from changing the, the the gauge of the wire to the asymmetry of the coils to the size of the magnet. I mean, there's it's just so many things that you can do. He had all these prototypes, and he was just like, you know, uh, putting them in the guitar. And uh, I was there. I, I had Nolly come out because I really trust his ear as well. Yeah. And uh, we were just sort of blind testing these. And this was uh, this is the one that we went with uh, as the sort of basis of the design, and it was the hybrid, yeah. uh, which he was very happy about because he was like, you know, I, I didn't know if this is, was going to work or not, but it, but it ended up working out very nicely. Well, uh, you should come down to Anderton's or wherever your local Jackson USA stockist is and, and try one of these because they are they're just beautifully, beautifully made and not kind of... You know, you've got the choice, haven't you, of either having a sort of a, a fairly obvious periphery. Yeah, style this, is, this, is the, it, um, this is plainer, the full on. Yeah. This is the full on model. But I very deliberately made yeah. the the sort of standard version. This is actually yeah. the more difficult version to get because uh, these inlays are are done by Ron Thorne, who's right. like quite a quite a in demand uh, guy. Is he? In demand guy, yeah, like a, as a guitar builder, and he does fantastic inlay work. So. They're, they're a detail. bit they're a bit more difficult to mm. get and they're uh, you know the price is uh, I probably shouldn't talk about that no it's That's fine <laughs> price no, it's the, a, price, it's, the it? price is the price because yeah. because it's it's the inlay is done by Ron Thorne and you have like a, a few extra yeah. sort of things here but the guitar itself is the same on the stair model. it has my name nowhere on it which is something I was very adamant about uh, it's just the guitar um, because I, I know that that can be very off-putting for yeah. some people uh, yeah so this is kind of like it's it's more 
a collaborative design even than a signature guitar you just wanted to yeah sort of just make well i mean yeah it's like i get to make my perfect guitar yeah. i don't really care if it has my name this actually yeah. does even this one doesn't have my name the, the closest yeah. thing it has is just like this bulb why, like, why, why, why is your nickname bulb uh that's just sort of this thing that just, happened I, it was my band in toronto at the right. time and i uh posted up a bunch of my ideas on this page that you could post your ideas a sound click page yeah. and the band's name was bulb the band right. broke up but i kept posting stuff and i kind of like had always been posting stuff on that page and I, I guess people started to call me bulb and it used to be like my my uh my forum name as well right okay and and then uh when people would call me that i used to try to explain but then i realized that that was really long-winded and was, was was kind of a pain, so I was like, "All right, fine, I'm bulb." You know, I just sort of accepted my fate there and ran with it. Oh well, look, that's look. It's been an absolute pleasure having you come to Andertons for the masterclass last night. If you get to see Misha uh, in a masterclass anywhere, I don't really care what kind of music you're into. You should go. He's a he's a a, a fantastic person to listen to about composition and music and tips about making it in the music industry, particularly modern day music industry where the pitfalls are very different to what they were, you know, 15 years ago. Um, played some great tunes, you know, was really, really engaging with the crowd. But yes, it's lovely. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Gigging man. tonight as well. So, you know, I appreciate uh, you taking the time out to come of course, to us. man, it's a pleasure. I hope the tour is immensely successful. And, thank uh, you. and I shall see you either next time I'm in the US or you're back in the UK. Do I'll definitely by. stop by here and actually like, play a bunch of your uh, guitars thanks, and man. pedals and stuff next time. Cool. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, right. See you later. Talk over, see if we've got some beautiful backing music. You might not be able to hear me. I'll sing it. Hello, this is Lee and Misha Mansour. The captain meets Misha Mansour. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Cool. I've got one other request. Can you just say, uh, Hi, this is Misha Mansour, and you're watching Anderson's TV straight to camera? Hi, this is Misha Mansour, and you're watching Anderson's TV. It's Anderton's. Oh, Ander, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Keep, sorry. Keep that in. That's even yeah. better. <laughs> I was so cocky yeah. about it, right? <laughs> right? Hi, this is Misha Mansour, and you're watching Flanderman's. <laughs> right. Hi, this is Misha Mansour, and you're watching Anderson's... God damn it. <laughs> that time I wasn't trying to do it. All right. Jet lag. We're, we'll call this jet lag. <laughs> this should have been a one this take. This should have been a one take this is thing. The best thing. Because that time I was actually trying to say Andertons. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right, mouth, don't fail me. Hey, what's up? This is Misha Mansour, and you are watching Andertons TV. In the bag. There we go. <laughs> it only took five takes. Jesus Christ. What's wrong with me, man?